Oh, you, you do. Yep. Okay. Now shall we start? In one minute. <laughs> oh, no. I just want to run in front. Is it too dark if I turn off the, this one? Okay, good. Uh, so a couple of no, yeah, a couple of assessments. So the we push back uh, upon the TA's recommendation assignment four to the following Friday. So meaning it's now due on the twenty eighth. So it's because the organization that the group blah de blah organization is a bit complex with such a big class. So. Uh, please follow uh, the TA's directions, okay? So meaning that if you're having trouble with the number that you are in your group, if you can't find, if someone is not there in your group, just follow your TA's direction. So on Friday, you're going to keep working on assignment four in class, okay? And so the goal is to actually submit a video of the findings that you have, okay? Uh, the format, choose whatever is you're more comfortable with. If it's Zoom, then you record something that each of you participate in in Zoom. But if you're used to voice uh, thread, I don't know if you are. This is ve it's a very convenient thing, but the learning curve can be a bit steep just for an assignment, so don't worry about it if you don't know it. Use Zoom, okay? And let me know any questions otherwise, okay? So because we push back uh, another week, uh, assignment four, it means that assignment five now is out of the window. So there won't be an assignment five. Um, the next assignment is the sixth, which is the survey. I have been getting emails that you have been submitting um, interviews, and uh, but I don't know if everyone <coughs> has, because it's a lot of data. And I usually take care of it at the end of the semester. Uh, but remember that the goal is to interview five people, including yourself. So you have to fill out that questionnaire five times. The last part of the questionnaire says, you know, write up, it's a write up about your experience. You should do that only once. Uh, and, you know, rather at the end than at the beginning, but it doesn't matter, just do it once. Okay, so assignment six is due May 5th. Okay? The following due date is about uh, exam three, which is on May 12th, which is the last Friday. Okay? Is that clear for the next uh, assignments? Uh, okay. Did someone check the, the percentage of the assignments? I, is it 30 or 40 percent? I think it's 40 percent. So 40 divided by five, you have to. So it's eight. No, it's not. It's not the difference. How much? 35. Oh, okay. Seven. Okay. So it's not that different. Seven uh, percent. Usually the assignments, from what I've seen, um, are very well. You, you get, you got good grades. So uh, this is supposed to be the strong type of thing because uh, this is something you can work on. Okay. Uh, okay. So we are still working on uh, accents and dialects uh, in the U.S. And today we'll concentrate on African-American vernacular English. So there are two different types of, of um, way of talking about it. It's A-A-V-E, V stands for vernacular. I realize that in my slide I don't put it there, but we can call it A-A-E or A-A-V-E, right? So this is the subject of your assignment four, so you know a bit about it already. Just know that UMass <coughs> as a center uh, for the study of African-American uh, African language, 
Lisa Green, Professor Lisa Green in, in the linguistic department is the director and she's been at UMass. She got her PhD actually at UMass and she came back in uh, 2006, right? And she's the author of multiple books and articles about African American English. She's one of the worldly uh, renowned uh, specialists of African American English, okay? I didn't ask her to, to come, uh, you know, give a guest lecture like I did in the past because she's, she has two jobs right now. She's a professor, but she's also in the grad school, so graduate school. So um, you're gonna have to uh, support me another for another lecture. So uh, AAE is a distinct dialect, and so remember what we talked about for dialects, how we distinguish them. Can someone bring me a couple of differences? What do we pay attention to? So accents are different things, right? Uh, having another accent is not the same thing as speaking another dialect. So what, what does it mean to speak another dialect? Oh yeah, syntactical differences, right? What else? Differences in vocabulary, so we use different words, right? Yeah. Yeah, for example, okay, those are syntactic differences. It's an example of a syntactic difference, the double negation. I was watching that show and, uh, oh no, it's actually a reality TV show. I'm not gonna share more than that, it's terrible. But uh, one of the participants was using double negation, right? And so it was a nice uh, example. So it's been, I think, more and more common to hear double negation, but it's true that it's, uh, something that we hear across dialects in the U.S. Uh, AAE, African American English, is one of them, right? It's not the only one, right? Uh, what else do we, how do we distinguish different dialects? We pay attention to uh, sounds and so on. What do we say, yes? Pronunciation. Yeah, pronunciation. So to be more exact, we're gonna be paying attention to the sounds in that, uh, right, so in that dialect too. So one thing you have to remember is that you're gonna be able to understand, I think, uh, a speaker of any dialect that is derived from English. I think so, right? Maybe with some time. Another language is a different story, right? If that language is, is different from your own, right? Uh, but in each case, you're gonna have a different set of sounds, you know, different vowels, right? Consonants, it's unlikely, but what they're gonna differ and how they're gonna differ is how they pronounce, right? So we talk, for example, of vowels, the A vowels, the A, the back A, or the front A, and so on. So we pay attention to all of that. When we talk about AE, one of the thing is that they do use air dropping like in the, the New England dialect, the Boston dialect, okay? That's something they have in common. So what we're gonna talk about is, I, I put a couple of words here, but what I wanna talk about more is the question of the education, which is related to your assignment somehow, um, and uh, about aspects, so the grammar itself in AE because it's really interesting to see how complex it is in AE. Um, okay, so first the educational problem. So you're gonna have, so one of the thing I should say is that, um, where is it? So some African American are speaking African American English, not all, right? That's one of the things that you have to keep in mind, okay? Because the name is not perfect, right? Um, but we are kind of stuck with it. But so for the children who are speaking AE at home, they go to school. And one of the issues which I talked to you about is that their dialect won't be recognized as a proper dialect, right? They're gonna be, for example, misdiagnosed as having some kind of issue uh, with um, the grammar of their language, right? So, uh, Schools use standard English, right? And uh, so uh, do all the jobs, right, that uh, you can get in, in the States when those kids grow up, right? What are the schools obligated to do 
and what should they do, okay? And so at one point before 19, uh, I think it's 79, uh, there was no decision about this, right? So actually people went to court um, to actually, uh, uh, you know, made it in the, in the books that um, AAE is a distinct dialect and children who speak it should be actually uh, taught standard English. But they had to go to court for this. If we had time, I'll show you a video about this, okay? So one of the thing, and I'll talk a bit about the characteristic, and I did that last week, but it's been a long time. Um, one of the kind of issue that came up, you know, with children speaking AE is that they were regarding as not speaking properly English, right? It was not recognized as a, as a dialect, right? And uh, we would, you know, people, or teachers would tell them you're not speaking correctly, right? Uh, and it's, of course, not the case everywhere, and that's where the Ann Arbor decision is coming from, because people are educated, uh, and some people know really about different dialects in English, right? So one of the, the traits that teachers that you can think about is the absence of the third person singular, right? That's one way of describing uh, this that is not super satisfying because I'm using standard English, right, in comparison with AAE. It's just that there is no copula. So I talked about that last week, right? So the student reading, right, in standard English, you would be saying uh, the standard, uh, the student is reading, is reading, right? That book too expensive, right? The, uh, the absence of a third person singular, it drives too fast, okay? Those are features of the dialect, okay? They are features of the dialect. The student be reading those sentences too fast. So I'll talk about this in a minute. That's the aspect side of a, okay? It's a, it's a marker, it's a, a marker of um, habit, habitual B, we call it. Okay, I'll talk about this in a minute. Um, and you can ask questions or make comments whenever you feel, okay? Um, there is a couple of things that, uh, that Professor Lisa Green would talk about if she was here. Uh, it's a hotly uh, debated topic, right? There is that kind of, I talked about this last week a tiny bit is the, the slang hip-hop controversy, right? So people have been calling AE just slang, right? Um, it's very much used in hip-hop or rap, and actually singers who try to imitate or are not born, right, uh, speaking AE, make mistakes, they make errors. So it's quite interesting when you study that. Okay, um, there is that question, uh, is it a separate language, right? The fact that it is recognized as a dialect is quite recent, okay? There is the, the big, uh, you know, controversy about uh, where is it coming from? What's the history of AE, right? And there are actually multiple uh, history, and we don't really know, right, uh, where AE is coming from. We, if we have time, I'll talk a bit about the possible options and the recent innovation controversy and the sounding black, which is uh, completely uh, related to uh, music, right? Rappers trying to sound black, right? And appropriating or using a, right, in their, in their songs and just making mistakes, plain and simple. So, sub-dialect? a good question. Um, so as you know, there are many, many different dialects, right, in the states. And so the question of AE and the sub-dialects, yeah. So uh, you were asking about, are there any sub-dialects of AE being spoken in the south? 
yeah, good question. Probably is the case, yeah. Um, you know, the, the history of uh, dialects is really quite interesting and quite complex as well. Right. If you go to the, you know, the year, uh, the thing I told you about last week, uh, that actually um, accounts for the different areas and what type of, mostly I think it is syntax, right? What type of things they can say. You could look at it and see what's happening there, right? Uh, to find actually um, common uh, features with um, A. Okay. I should give you a, a thing, right? So one of the things that you have to be able to distinguish as, you know, linguist in training, if you want, is uh, drawing distinction between what's on grammatical and what's actually dialectal, right? Uh, and that's, I think, one of the mistakes that teachers have been making. Um, considering A errors, like ungrammatical, yeah, it was actually dialectal, right? Syntactic uh, dialectal. So something like she be reading too fast is part of a dialect, right? Or he was steady reading. Or she usually reads too fast, which is much more like standard, right? Um, and standard is not supposed to be, I don't love that term very much, right? So what would be a better term than standard English? I'm not saying I have an answer for that, but there is some kind of implication. Yeah. Yeah. Ah. So you use the uh, white English? Ah. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah, no, no. So we we talked uh, we talked about that. That is really not a satisfying term to talk about standard. And and <laughs> the the one thing that's interesting is when you say standard, you think there is a norm, which you really want to stay away from, right? So. Yeah. Uh, I think I, she's. I still don't really know how I feel about that. Yeah, that's. Like yeah, that's the one that uh, J. E. Uh, Lisa Green is using. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's not bad because it tells you how you know uh, common it is across the space. So, I and it doesn't make reference to a norm, which I really, really prefer, right? Yeah, but standardized doesn't have exactly the same, right? Uh, uh, we w it's this is not what we're talking about when we talk about this, right? Okay. There's one more here. Okay. Okay. One of the thing, and I told you about that the the movie. Uh, 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 sorry to bother you, right, where the, the main actor is switching in between white English, I love that term, and black English, right? And, and so he's taking his white voice and he's on the phone calling white people. So one of the things that's going to happen is exactly that. So uh, people will be, bi be dialectal, right? They're going to be able to switch back and forth. So you talked a lot about this. Um, uh, on the discussion forum about code switching, right? It's, there are different things. It's, it's different to, to be talking about two different dialects and depending on where you are, you know, physical places and spaces, you're gonna switch to a different dialect that you speak completely, right? Um, that you are completely bilingual in, right? This is different from code switching when you're bilingual and you speak two international languages and you insert words or phrases inside, right? Do, do you see the, the difference? It's, it's not exactly the same thing. You have to be careful about this. Just f something we that came up, right? Um, J-E. Okay. So 
let's talk a bit about aspects. So we talked a tiny bit about this, but I never know what you can remember and what you don't remember. So aspect is, is parallel, um, what coexists in the verbal system, right, in the grammar with tense. And we talked about ing, for example, last week. Um, aspect is different because it gives you um, something, it, it gives you information about the action of the verb, the right? Um, tense is different, it tells you when it's happening, right? So we usually say that there is past and present in English. Future is not really a tense, right? Um, just because it's not marked grammatically in English, like the past. Sorry. Yeah, but will is actually not, right? It's, it's, it's a more thing that you add, and so it's not really a, we don't really consider it tense. I'm not trying to, trying to create a debate, but just keep, keep that in mind. Aspect is different, because it's going to tell you, for example, um, if something is over or if it's not, right? So generalized English. I'm going to switch back and forth in two different terms. Has two aspects, okay? One that is perspective, right? So it means that it's completed. John has written his assignment, so meaning he's done, okay? So the past perfect is going to give you that information. It's perspective, okay? The other aspect that you have um, in English is the ongoing progressive. Tense, okay? I should not say tense. The aspect, right? Progressive aspect. John is writing his, assign his assignment, so meaning is it's happening right now, right? And he has still more to do, okay? So you only have those two. Yep. So it's I'm just no, no, you can. It's not related to the tense. The tense information is going to come on top of that. So you're going to have progressive in the past. You're going to have progressive in the future and so on. Right? The one thing I think that doesn't uh, present perfect is, is a fact. OK, it's another thing. So you're going to have combination. It's going to give you different information. Get stuck again. Okay, who needs the lead? Okay, can I have one? Huh? Do you need another one? Ruben? Okay. So we'll see that AE has uh, four, right? Different type of aspect. And it can combine, in, you know, those can combine with each other to express different ones. So those are might be something that you know or not. Okay, the first one we'll talk about is the habitual aspect. It's be, okay? It means usually. I be in my office at 7.30. So meaning it's something that happens over and over again. I plan to and I, I, I in my office by 7.30. It be nice in there. It be I speaks in there. She be telling people she ate, okay? Habitual. Your phone bill be high, don't it? Because the person is talking very much. So that's back then where it wasn't, you know, like uh, um, unlimited. It don't be drove hardly. What does it mean? It don't be drove hardly. <laughs> now that you are learning a bit of AE, what? Well, yeah, or it, it doesn't drive very well, right? Um, it's a, it's. Again, it's something that's habitual, that's known, right, to the speaker, okay? Habit. Okay. This one I can forget. Perfective aspect is marked by done, right? It means finish, okay? What you have to be careful about is that, uh, or notice, is where those elements are appearing. They're appearing exactly in inside the, the verbal phrase, okay? So, uh, because it's it's a tense information, 
is there, one. So meaning it, it doesn't tell you how long, right? Uh, when you think about sense versus aspect, so English is not especially interesting, in a sense, you know, the, the general one, because it's very cool in terms of aspect. If you think about Russian, it's much richer, right, and so on. So sense is different from aspect. Real will be a, a tense. So I, I said it's not a tense, but it's a tense information anyway. Okay. Yeah. So whether it's still happening, whether you know it's it's over. So imagine a you know a time frame, a line, and you're going to have I either something that's as open and still happening, or it's closed, right? It's, it gives you information about um, the process itself, okay? And it's gonna combine with tense information, and then you're gonna have different types of right, uh, process that you can describe. Let's see if, if you want, you know, if it's make it, if I can make it clear with those examples, <laughs> right? So done means finished. John done is assignment. I told him you done changed, right? Done, you know, changing. I done already finished that. So I mean, I, I'm done, right? Uh, people would say that medicine I'm taking done make me sick, okay? So it means finish. That's perfective aspect, right? Because the perfective aspect is exactly that, okay? Uh, third one, it, it has what we call, it's describing momentous aspect. It's marked by verb, the verb plus ing. Is is optional, the copula is. And it means right now, okay? John writing his assignments, and John is writing his assignments right now, okay? John writing his assignments. There is a remote aspect as well. So it's called, it's a, uh, this, I think that's the one that I first heard about. He been married, right? That been, and we, in, in linguistics, we um, uh, write it like this, B-I-N, right? He been married, it means he has been married for a while, okay? Um, for a long time. I've been knowing he died, means I have known he, he died for quite some time. Um, they've been bad. The police going bad. They ain't going bad. They've been bad, right? So for a long time, the police has been bad. Where did you get that shirt? I been had it. I have it. I had it for a while. Okay. So again, see that it combines with verbs like and copula or have verbs and so on, right? And it's going to be describing very, um, you know, precisely uh, those, uh, yeah, it's been for a while. It's been the case for a while. Okay, yeah. I have to check that because I, anyone know? Yeah. I don't it's B E E N. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. So I, I think it's just the. Um, um, some of you know about international phonetic alphabet. That would be the BIM uh, way of describing <laughs> the IPA way of uh, of writing BIM. Okay. Thanks for answering that. So now we can look at combination of those aspectual markers. So we can combine habitual and perfective. So it means usually finished, okay? John B. Dunn wrote this assignment. So it means that uh, as a, you know, um, a habit around this time, he's done with his assignment. So you combine B and done, right? And then you have wrote, right? B. Dunn wrote his assignment. You, you have quite some complexity here, right? So it's very nice. You can get actually more and more detail about the process of the action of what you're describing, right? Another one is the perfective plus remote. 
Okay, so meaning finished a long time ago. So it's the bean, not the bee, and done, right? John being done wrote his assignment. So for a while now, John is done, has been done. Okay? Okay. I properly. Any questions? We have time for the video, so that good news. Don't fall asleep during the video. It's very instructional. Questions? Okay. I hope the quality isn't too bad. Sometimes it's terrible. Sheen and Healy were students at this school. Situated in a prosperous video that gives you good. When rural southern blacks eventually moved to the cities of the north, they brought their own kind of English with them. They're young men now, but 25 years ago, Duane, Asheen, and Keeley were students at this school. Situated in a prosperous, mostly white suburb of Ann Arbor, there were not many black kids at the Martin Luther King School. When they spoke, as they did at home, in African-American English, their teachers simply assumed they couldn't do schoolwork. They sort of felt like we were unteachable in a sense, I would feel. So I kind of made them go towards other students more and gave them a little bit more help than they would give us. Can you remember some of the things that were said, teachers would say? Actually, um, to be honest, the teachers really didn't even communicate with us too much. It just was sort of like the sense that we were on our own. Do you remember any of that? You were younger. I was really young, but I mean, I remember enough to know that I wasn't being treated the same way as all the other kids in the class or a lot of the other kids. You know, that's the irony of it all. It's Martin Luther King School and, you know, they haven't learned anything from Martin Luther King. Well, hopefully they learned it, but they didn't learn it back then. Three mothers refused to accept second best for their sons. Annie, what was it that got you and other parents upset enough to bring a lawsuit against the school? Um, my kids was tested and was tested and was put into special ed classes, and I felt like that they were not getting educated and was not treated equally and I felt like that shouldn't be a barrier because of a language to stop them from being educated. Ruth Zweitler is a social worker familiar with the housing project the boys came from. Listening to Annie tell how her son and his friends were failing at school, she knew something was wrong. There were maybe 24 black, poor black children in a sea of affluent white families. And they really were having a very hard time. Ruth became convinced that the kids were being discriminated against because of their African-American English. Language is the marker for assumed attitudes coming with an implied criticism, which is what I think a black child carries with them. We as Adults as mainstream society as Americans have really done bad by these little kids. Hi, Ruth. Hey. How are you? How good to see you. Good. Unable to make any headway with the school administrators, Ruth went to Detroit. One of the lawyers she consulted was Ken Lewis. The legal strategy they and others thrashed out led to a landmark court decision on black English. Our job was to see if we could come up with some legal theories that made sense that we could pursue on their behalf. The initial thrust of the case was to deal with the children's poverty as the reason why they were not being educated. There is really no constitutional right not to be poor in this country and so trying to find some constitutional provision that would help us along those lines was a futile effort. So language became a part of it and since that language barriers seem to impact adversely only on black youngsters. 
we were able to tie in the race issue. The most significant thing that I believe was raised during that trial was that you had a federal judge acknowledge formally that African American vernacular English represented a significant linguistic barrier to academic achievement and success. He confirmed that the school district was really insensitive to the linguistic background of the vast majority of African American students within the school district. Years later, the argument Ken Lewis used in this courthouse was raised by educators in Oakland, California. But they claimed black English, which they called Ebonics, was a separate language. That caused a national storm, and as we'll see, it's an issue school boards are still grappling with. One of the things that I remember Judge Joynick indicating in his opinion was the need to help youngsters appreciate the difference between the language of the majority, how it would impact upon your being perceived by others. That was part of the discussion we had to wrestle with in the black English case because we thought that the teachers were not respecting the language as it should have been. If a young black who talked like Puff Daddy applied for a job in this law firm, <laughs> would he get it? The reality is he has to fit the criteria, the skills that are required for this particular job. Just like if I wanted to go on the radio and become the commentator for the R&B rap hip hop station, I'm going to have to change my language skills because I got a, a different audience I'm appealed to. I'm wrestling with it now with my own 15 year old who, you know, communicates to me in language that I'm not necessarily sure I understand, but I'm, I'm working on it. I'm, I'm, I'm finding that I'm coming. Okay, comments about the, the video. Let me go back to you. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I do wonder. The, the black English is possible. And maybe he's disconnected from him or he, he doesn't, you know. But uh, the slang is, is another option. Because you're going to be, if your parents uh, like me, you're going to be uh, confronted to it very much already. I don't know who was next, uh, Francisco. Yeah, but that's the that's the unalterable decision that they have to still have to. It's a solution they propose. Um, How is it different from teaching in the school I mean system, like public? Just like they, rather than forcing people to acknowledge it and like try to understand it as well, they can also teach them to use what English we usually speak here, like in an educational area. Yeah, but I, yeah, I That's don't see. That's a solution, not yeah. the solution. Yep. Okay. Okay. Uh, who was next? Andrew next or next? Andrew? It's, it's the, the language itself. So meaning AAE was not recognized as a proper uh, language. And so one of the things that I think that we missed a bit was that instead of telling to the child you're not speaking correctly, they're going to say, well, here is how general English or white English works. And you have to learn because in order to get a job and, you know, and so on. So next. AAE, good question. 
So we know that there is a very strong uh, against uh, bilingual education in the States. It's changing, right? It's, it's going back to, so I would say no, but are there teachers that primarily speak AAE that will be able to communicate with kids that speak AAE? Yeah, I think so, right? But it's not the language of education. Yeah. Who is next? Exactly, exactly, yes, yeah, exactly. That's a very common mistake, um, misdiagnosing the, the kids speaking AE as having a, a disorder, right? Yes, um, you know. Ah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yep. Yep. Has to be done. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thanks for that point. Uh, everybody heard it. So uh, that it was. I think it's the way you go when you have kids coming from a dialectical uh, background that is different from the general English. You need to compare. This is how we say it in the English that you don't hear. It's a difference. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, I feel like it's there's a lot of it puts a lot of burden on the reading system to get things right that it doesn't actually that it's not actually built for the child. Yeah, they're not linguists, right? Yeah. Yeah. They, that's a that's a huge issue and it's completely related to the thing in uh, number four, right? Because when you have someone who is uninformed, when you have a judge who is completely uninformed linguistically, he's gonna really make bad, bad decisions and not actually be, <laughs> um, he's going to be the opposite of an advocate for the victim. So it's really a big, a huge issue. So the, the question is how education can change that, right? Um, that's a bit of your job to think about. Okay, so you talking about the linguistic barrier? Okay, so um, I think one of the thing of the video here was that you had indeed uh, in that, you know, um, I really like what you said about the Martin Luther King School and, and learning it actually for people are mostly white, right? Um, I don't know if uh, Martin Luther King spoke uh, AE, I have no idea. But there was that, uh, the issue was that kids were not understood and they were judged as uneducated and being failed right at school. Because they actually didn't, they needed actually to learn the general English or the white English. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Okay. I think so. I think, I think that she probably thought, you know, he, he, he has some kind of, you know, diagnosed, undiagnosed uh, trouble with language. <laughs> so couldn't intervene, couldn't help. Yeah. Yep. Vernacular? Ver vernacular English. Yeah, I, I didn't put it in my slides. I should have. Vernacular, vernacular. It's another uh, way of describing a dialect, but it's an old term. Um, yeah, I don't know the, it's, it's, I think it's French because I, that's something I can say in French very easily. Someone else was raising their hand. So 
you know, remember that when we were talking about the other dialect in the States, there I asked you that question that was very blunt. I, I made you listen to a couple of things and I asked, do they seem intelligent, right? For example, because there are actually strong negative biases that we're going to associate depending on where we're coming from, right? Uh, it's very common, but biases are things that we learn. It's not something we're born with, right? Okay. And so it's the case with AE that people, and uh, this is, uh, I don't want to say too much about the Simon Ford, but this is exactly what happened with the testimony of uh, John Chantel at Trayvon's Martin uh, on the, the murder of Trayvon's Martin. She was judged and she was discredited as a witness because of the language she, sp she spoke, right? And so the entire um, jury uh, just didn't trust her or a judgment, right? Because of the language. And it's a life of death situation, right? So it's huge, huge uh, consequences. Um, other questions? So think a bit about uh, when you work in groups, Whatever your role is, you can talk to each other about the different roles and what can education do, right? So th the fact that you mentioned that uh, actually speech uh, pathologists are now educated in different dialects, that's crucial for me. That seems like, yes, that's the way to go, right? What about judges? And if we had someone speaking Portuguese in court, we would have, what, a translator. Right? So why, why can't we actually do the same for dialects of English? Right? There was an uh, end. Did you, you want to say something? Yeah? Uh-huh. Yeah, that's a good uh, that's a good point. So rule three is about the background. Well, I was thinking about the Trayvon Martin's uh, killing, right? What happened? Uh, the fact that she was on the phone with him and so on, right? So think about all the context. That's what I'm thinking about because the other role is about AAE, right? The other is about John Richard, what he did, what the study is. He came at UMass a few years ago to give a talk about this. It was really great. Um, so yeah, if you have questions, you can address to your TA. They should know about all of this. Yep. It's a, it's a very good point. Are there any cases of uh, in court of uh, a document or filing where the dialect had an impact, right, on the decision of the court? Good question. This is for me the, the one that I know of. Uh, but what about Southern dialect? Yeah, I don't know. If anyone knows. Uh, yeah. That is true. So uh, the, the bias that you that the what why what is it called the person be transcribed in court is that it's not a scribe right? Yeah. A what? Stenographer. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So thank you. Okay. So your point was that the you we in the article that it's obvious that you you get this uh, bias. The the thing is like there is really that that um, always always check within yourself because everybody is